Hello, welcome to the Brooklyn Knit Folk Podcast. This is episode number 71. My name is Jacqueline. You can find me over on Instagram and Ravelry is at Jacqueline Salem. Thank you so much for joining me today. If this is your first time watching, this is a vlog that I highlight my recent projects, mostly knitting and sewing related, and then whatever crafty stuff I happen to get up to in the in between. And I live in, uh, as the name of the podcast would suggest, <laughs> Brooklyn, New York City with my boyfriend and my two kitties. And yeah, it's been a great couple of weeks since the last time I saw you. I finished a dress. I had one that actually didn't go so well. We'll talk about that in a little bit. I'm in progress on one knitting project to share with you today. First, I just wanted to give a big thank you, as always, to my patrons who help support this podcast, to keep it on my YouTube channel for you guys to all enjoy. If you want to support me over on Patreon, you can do that at patreon.com slash Jacqueline Salem. So with that, let's get into the podcast and we'll start with the knitting content. As before, in my bag made by my friend Dawn, it's this like amazing striped fabric and she embroidered a tulip on it and I put some of my pins here. I have the pair of socks that I showed you in the last episode, but I think they were just like a wee baby sack. And for some reason, I've just really felt like knitting on them lately. So first I'll show you the yarn. This is the Folklore Colorway by Grenue Co. And it's this really beautiful chartreuse green, swamp green, some navy, some gold. Feels very magical and fairy tale like I uh, subscribed to the um, Grenue Co. 12 day advent calendar last Christmas and I really, really liked it. If you're someone who likes the darker, moodier colors, she does those very well. She does intersperse them with other lighter colors, but um, if you are somebody who kind of prefers those dark, moody colors, then this would be a great one for you to check out. Also, um, oh, what is, uh, I, I can picture, I can picture her. She also does moody colors extremely well, and she lives in either New Jersey or like in the outskirts of New York, like New York City. I can't remember. I'm really sorry. I'm going to put the name on the screen, but she also does moody colors very well. And I don't know if she does an advent calendar or not, but she would be a great resource if you wanted to look into that. But anyway, this is, like I said, Grenuico in the folklore colorway. And here's a close up of the sock and how it knits up. It is pooling like ever so slightly, which is not my favorite, but I'm not about to hold or alternate like two ends of the skein in order to not have that happen. So it's just something I'm gonna have to live with. But this is just a regular basic vanilla sock recipe, except for instead of the 64 stitches that I normally cast on for myself, I cast on 68 stitches for Andrew. He has a narrower man's foot. Usually I feel like uh, the stitch counts for men's socks are around 72 stitches, but we found that the 68 just fits him better. Um, just like a little bit narrower foot. And I finished the leg. I capped it off here. This is shorter than I normally knit legs. I usually go for like an eight or nine inch leg. This one's probably about seven because um, he has a really long foot. I feel, I can't, I think his shoe size is like a 12 or something. So they're gonna take forever to knit the feet. I really wanted to attempt to get these finished by Saturday because this coming Saturday is his birthday but I don't think that's gonna happen. This is still the first sock, so unless I like knit like the wind, then I don't think it's gonna happen. But I've only been working on this like a little bit every day, and so far it's been, you know, things are getting done. I use the Fish Lips Kiss heel, which is my favorite heel pattern. It is a short row heel, and it costs $1, and you can get as customized as you want. It kind of looks like an intimidating pattern when you open it, because there are 16 pages in it. I think for you, like, sock architecture people, if you really want to get, like, an amazing short row heel fit, this would be a great pattern, because you can get very customizable with it. But I only use one page out of the pattern and just knit the heel pattern 
as is without any of the customization options and it's just the one I have memorized and I haven't knit a sock heel in like well over six months this is like my first pair of socks since easily last fall and I still can it's just sticks in my brain I just like I've knit it so many times that that's just the one I really like I'm not really a heel flapping gusset kind of girl I like the look but I don't like knitting them as much as I like knitting short row heels so that's the leg finished and then now I finished the heel and I've moved on to knitting the foot. All right, and that's all of the knitting content that I have to share with you for today. As I mentioned in my last episode, knitting just hasn't been kind of where the focus of my creative mojo has been lately. It's really been with the sewing. I expect that my knitting will ramp up more in the fall and winter. That just kind of seems to be the way it goes. But knitting for me, as I also mentioned last episode, is so situational. I used to knit on the subway to and from work and on my lunch break and now that I don't have that like built-in knitting time anymore I just don't knit as much because I'd rather be sewing so no pun intended um but yes I love knitting um yeah nothing against it's just not where like my creative mojo is right now but oh my gosh how much I just really I have the most beautiful yarn stash like because I've really curated it over the past year or so I don't have a lot about like I don't know four maybe a little like six small tubs of yarn and so many of most of them are farm yarns and like non superwash stuff which is really just like where my heart is when it comes to knitting I love superwash yarn for socks but and more and more like for my garments the ones i actually wear the most are ones that i are like purchased from like farm and fiber tour and um yeah that's just like kind of what i gravitate most toward for the knitting and then also brooklyn tweed i really love brooklyn tweed yarn especially for sweaters it just has such a great drape and it wears so well and yeah okay so sewing projects next first i'll start off with a finished but not usable make. So this is the Loon Dress, a pattern by uh, French Poetry. And I love this detail in the front. Like I love the bodice construction of this so much. I'll show you kind of a close up. It has this kind of gathered bust in like a triangular, kind of like cups, uh, the breasts. And I just love how it, this looks, but I don't know if it's the fabric, I don't know if it's something with the pattern, something that I did, I don't really know. I mean, I followed instructions almost to a T. So I'm hoping maybe somebody here knows where it went wrong, but we'll see. So first of all, I did not stay stitch this neckline. It's cut on bias and I did not stay stitch that neckline. The instructions didn't say to. If it says to, I always, I always follow the instructions usually with that sort of thing. I think from now on I'm going to get in the habit of if it's cut on bias or just like a curved neckline of any kind, I'm just going to go ahead and stay stitch the neckline. Stay stitching is where you just kind of immediately before constructing the pattern, especially around like armholes and necklines, you just do a row of stitching within the seam allowance and that helps the fabric not shift around because when you cut, cut things on bias or on a curve, the fabric will stretch out of shape. And this is a really deep V, so this would have been a good candidate for stay stitching. And I probably just should have done it anyway, but I didn't think to because the instructions didn't say to. So that's the first thing that could have helped this. The second thing was that in the instructions, kitty, come here. No, oh, you want to lay on my pants? Okay. Um, the second part of the instructions uh, that may have, or the second thing about constructing this dress that may be the culprit behind this is that it, well, maybe I should tell you what the problem is with it first. Okay, the, ne the neckline has stretched out of shape like crazy. It's like waving. You can see like up here, it's pulling at the shoulder seam. Um, it falls off of my shoulder on one side. It's like gaping out and I didn't change anything about the front of it. I just, I changed the back to be a square rather than this uh, v-neck back that it had before, but that shouldn't, I don't think, have affected the front, but maybe, maybe I'm wrong 
about that. I don't know. And the neckline on the back is high enough that it shouldn't have affected uh, anything to do with the dress. So I think it's just that the fabric stretched out of shape here because I didn't stay stitch it. Or the other thing is that the instructions tell you to sew in like a ribbon, like a twill ribbon or some sort of like ribbon something to stabilize the neckline. And I didn't have that, but I used interfacing instead. So I just used pieces of interfacing right here to stabilize it. And I figured that that would do the trick, but maybe I'm wrong. Like maybe that doesn't keep it from stretching out and that that ribbon, I should find exactly what it was and so I can share with you, but some sort of uh, ribbon to keep it from stretching. So I don't know if using interfacing instead was the culprit. Maybe it was, maybe it wasn't or if this fabric is just really prone to stretching out of shape. It's a real shame because the dress was really pretty. I did go ahead to do it. I did go ahead and decide to add uh, sleeves to it and I really liked, I know a lot of you wanted me to keep it in the maxi length and without the sleeves, but because the fabric is this like chiffon, it's not chiffon, it's a rayon chali, but it's this very fluid drape solid red color dress. It was just too formal for everyday use and I knew that if I added the sleeves and cut it to the shorter length it would make it more casual and therefore I would wear it more often. So and this was very much like the inspiration dress that I had. I'll insert a picture here for you to look at it. I mean that's what it was kind of supposed to be all along. I just got sidetracked because I had enough to make it a maxi and I like maxi dresses a lot but I just felt looking at myself in it, I'm never going to wear this. I feel like a bridesmaid right now because it's just too formal. So cutting it to the shorter length and adding the sleeves really helped make it uh, more casual. So I loved how like the design of it came out. I was going to add a waist tie as well to kind of avoid any kind of pregnancy vibes that it would have given because of the neckline or not neckline, but the waistline construction here so then I could tie it to my waist I went ahead I had really almost everything was done all I had left to do was hem it and then make the waist ties but when I tried it on it just the neckline stretched so much this hanger is like a bad example it's not like the hanger but you know maybe yeah uh, so I'm really disappointed because I loved this fabric so much and I was really really hoping to get a lot of wear out of this dress. I hopefully, I will try again. I really am eager to hear your opinion about why the neckline stretched out so much the way it did. You can see it waving and you can see it like, oh, I wonder if you can see if I show you closer up like where the interfacing, you can see where the edge of the interfacing is right here and where it's like rippling along that. If it could be the fabric, I don't know. So if you guys have any ideas, any experienced sewists out there have any ideas about why this would have stretched so much, even though I followed the, um, like I said, followed directions, cut the pattern exactly, except for the back right here, I cut it into a square instead of the v-neck that it was, and I used interfacing here instead of whatever, like, like t ribbon tape or something it said to use. I'll hopefully have put the name of it on the screen for you already so that you know exactly what it is. But other than that, follow directions. So please, if you have any ideas, help me because I would love to make this dress. Um, it was certainly a challenge. It was like the name of the game was easing everything in because despite my uh, cutting, which I tried to do very accurately, this fabric is so slippery that it was just very difficult to cut and pieces weren't matching up. And I had to like ease everything in because it just wasn't lining up properly so maybe the fabric was the culprit i don't know anyway would love to hear your opinion again this is the loon dress by french poetry patterns i'm a huge fan of french poetry patterns i've made the etoile dress three or four times now i use it as a base for a lot of other pattern hacking that i do because it has a really cute button-up front with a v-neck on it not this dress the etoile dress so i'm a huge huge fan of their patterns and desperately hoping they expand their size range because it's just like only in their best interest and everybody else's best interest so at any opportunity i like at mention them when i'm like hey maybe you could expand your size range mm, side note you can see like 
this wall in construction back here. I was hoping that in this episode of the podcast, you would be looking at new wallpaper wall that's supposed to be back there. I'm so excited about it, but there's just been snags along every stop along this road to get this wallpaper up. Um, but hopefully they're coming in two days to install the wallpaper. I could do it myself, uh, but Andrew really doesn't want to do it, so he just says he wants to hire somebody, which is fine by me. But anyway, yes, so hopefully next episode you'll see really cool wallpaper as the backdrop. All right, the next dress, one of my, I keep saying this, like every single project that I finish, it's my new favorite, it's my new favorite, but it really is. This is the dress I'm calling my strawberry dress. I don't know why, it just begs to be called the strawberry dress, in my opinion. I used uh, Simplicity mm, 8359. Let me go, let me go look real quick, just to confirm. Okay, I used Simplicity 8635, and I used the bodice on View B. This one right here, it has this scooped neckline darts at the waist and darts at the bust. First, I will start off by saying that if you are one of my bigger busted viewers, this pattern is great for you. As drafted, so I'm probably like a full B, small C cup, but as drafted, I think this would easily fit uh, C's and D's because the, there's just so much room in the cups as drafted. I have to like adjust for it every single time um, that I've made this, and I've probably made this bodice, see my birthday dress, the black dress, this dress, and another one. So I've made this bodice at least four times now, maybe more than that. I might even be forgetting other times I've used it. So four times that I've used this bodice now, and I have to make the same alterations and adjustments every time. So in the cups, there's always so much room in the cups. So if you are uh, C or D, I think Simplicity 8635 would be a great pattern for you. Technically, it's a jumpsuit and play suit pattern. So all of these are, like none of these are dresses attached to it. They're all shorts, sport, like pants style bottoms. But really, that's not a difficult alteration to make if you'd rather it be a skirt. If you like the jumpsuit, then awesome. But if you want to attach a skirt to it instead, just find a skirt pattern that you already have in your stash or hop on YouTube and look up how to do a half circle skirt tutorial or a full skirt tutorial or an A-line skirt tutorial. There's so much available. It's really quite simple. And just attach the bodice of this project or of this pattern to whatever skirt you want if you don't want the jumpsuit, which is how I use it because <sighs> jumpsuits, as much as I want to be a jumpsuit person, I am just not a jumpsuit person. I bought like three of them and I never wear them. They just sit in my closet, mostly because I get camel toe on every single one that I've ever tried to buy except for like one when it actually looked really cute. But I just don't feel confident in jumpsuits. I don't know why. I think they look so pretty and like so sexy on other people. But they're just not for me. They're not my style. So this is the bodice of 8635. And then the bodice back is self-drafted. So the front is 8635. But for some reason, all of the backs of 8635, let's see if I can show you. All of the backs of 8635 are these like open backs. They're like these lace-up backs. They're cute but they're not really all that functional for me to wear to like, I couldn't wear something like that to work. Not that I'm going to work anytime soon, but uh, I just wanted something that had a little more coverage so that I could wear it in more situations. So I used uh, the back bodice of, I think uh, my favorite McCall's M6955. I used uh, a modified version of that for the back and there are waist starts there as well. So the front, Simplicity 8635, the back, Modified McCall's M6955. You may notice, <laughs> I forgot to tell you. So there's not a button up on this. So the piece itself, I'm not gonna get in there because it's, but it's like you cut the piece on the fold so that when you open it, it's like one piece. But I really wanted a button up 
front. So to do that, all I did was extend the part that was put on the fold. I extended that out by like, I did some mathing to make sure that it worked, but I think I extended it by like an inch and a half or an inch and a three quarters or something like that. And then rather than cutting it on the fold, I cut it as separate pieces so that um, there was no like fold it open and it still be, you know, like one piece. So I had like separate pieces and I followed the instructions still um, for constructing the bodice, like doing the darts and attaching the lining to the self, like it's a lined bodice. Um, but instead of it being one piece, I had to contend with two pieces. And then when I pinned it to the skirt, uh, I had to do the buttonholes and the buttons first before I attached it to the skirt. So I had the bodice all complete first. So I did the butt, like constructed the bodice, did the buttons and the buttonholes, and then um, kind of left it buttoned up and then attached the full bodice to the skirt. I hope that makes sense to you guys. But yeah, it was really not a difficult alteration to make. So really, if you have a pattern piece that's cut on the fold, but you want it to be a button up, just extend the center front a little bit so that you have enough room for the overlap that it has to have. And um, I set my buttons, I'd say like the buttonholes start maybe a quarter of an inch to a half an inch. It looks like a quarter. Yeah, a quarter of an inch away from the center front. And that worked out pretty well. I had to like eke as much space as I could out of the zipper because it was like a little bit tight at first and I was kind of concerned. So I had to go back and use the scantest seam allowances I possibly could uh, to make sure that it fit at the waist. It was big up here, but to make sure it fit at the waist. Uh, added the straps, which I had Andrew, they were part inserted into the front of the bodice as the directions say to do for the simplicity, but I had to find a way to get them to the back. So I had Andrew pin the straps to me while they were on and they're just attached inside like so, nothing too crazy. I serged the edge to finish it and then did kind of like this box stitch with an X on it to make it look neat. That's what it looks like from the outside. I used a nude zipper and put in my label. I have black labels and white labels and those are from a Dutch label shop which they sent to me as a sample to try out and review. I only just found them when I moved into this apartment so I'm really excited to have them. I really love them. There's just something really fun about putting in your own label in your clothing. And I've attached it to what I wanted originally to be a half circle skirt. But as I was measuring out and cutting the skirt, I realized I had the stripe going horizontally instead of vertically like the rest of the dress. And I had already started cutting it. Luckily did not cut too much of it um, because I was still able to eke out this kind of more A-line skirt. But it all ended up being for the best anyway because the dress looks so good. I know this is like one of my best fitting dresses. So many of you guys loved it when I showed it on Instagram. This is a very close fitting bodice. I got a really good fit on it and then the skirt flares out just at the right point from my waist to accommodate my pear shape body. And I love it. I attached these belt loops, which really I just made like a little tube, cut it in half, and then sewed. Whoop, can see there. Maybe. There we go. And then uh, finished off the edge with the serger and then sewed it like so to either side. So I have two belt loops and then the skirt was a self-drafted circle skirt or half circle skirt, but turned into sort of a half uh, or turned into a self-drafted A-line skirt instead, which I just found by watching tutorials on YouTube. So added the belt loops, made this really long tie, hemmed it, and that is the strawberry dress. Oh, the fabric is a rayon chalet, a striped coral and ivory rayon chalet from fabric.com. And it's this really 
pretty kind of like pink and luckily it doesn't vibrate on the eyes too much from far away I feel like it reads more pink than it does striped so the size of the stripes is like a really good really good size there was no hope for pattern matching at the waist seam but it's lucky that the stripe was so small because it's not noticeable really especially because I have the waist tie so it doesn't really matter the next project I'm going to show you that Jafar is laying on oh kitty can I have this I forgot to show you this last time to be honest um I wouldn't call these a fail by any means they look like they're designed to look on my body. So this is the uh, Pomona Pants pattern by Anna Allen Clothing. I love Anna Allen Clothing graphic design and the way she writes her patterns. I've uh, pattern tested for her before in the past, the Demeter top, but I just don't think these pants are my style ultimately. So the modifications that I made where I added these pockets, these front, these front pork chop pockets, these are not part of the design. I took this pattern piece from the True Bias Lander pants and then put them on the front myself. But the back pockets are part of the design, which I think are a really attractive size and placement like they look really nice on like on the placement and size of the pocket on the butt but they're these elastic waistband pants there's only two pieces to the pants themselves so there's no seam on the side the seam is only around the interior like the inseam and up through the crotch one pattern piece is the front like this right here is one pattern piece and this right here is one pattern piece and it's attached at the inseam up through the crotch and then uh, kind of like up through the center front and center back. Can you see that? And these are flat felled. The seaming looks really nice. The pants are like when I put them on, they look exactly like they look in the pattern photos. They look like they're supposed to look. But I think that pants without a fly on the front just don't look right on me. They're not like my style, I think. I don't know why I made, like, it's not like I didn't know that going into them, but the lack of fly just looks strange and they just remind me too much of pajama pants. I know this is like a real look. It's a very aesthetic kind of pant. Uh, I think they are really cool on other people. Uh, the only thing I have left to do is to hem them but I think these will just end up turning into like house pants for me or like walking over to the garden pants. I don't anticipate that I'll like wear these for work or as like a fashion choice. Who knows, maybe I'll change my mind about that. The fit is really great. I made it out of this tinsel twill from fabric.com in the olive color. To me it kind of, on camera it is looking kind of olive, but in person it's lighter. It looks like more pea green to me which I don't know, maybe if they were darker I'd like them more, I, I don't know. I know a lot of people liked them when I showed them on Instagram, but they just didn't feel right to me without the fly. Maybe it's just me. So this is the Pomona Pants pattern by Anna Allen Clothing, a really great beginner pants pattern if you wanna just get into making pants and uh, you feel like a little intimidated like I did. Pants are one of the, la like the last frontier for me when it comes, just because they're so hard for me to shop for. Being a pair body is just like shopping for pants. I think for any woman is not a fun experience, but um, if you're looking for a really simple pants pattern, this would be a great one to get your feet wet if these are your aesthetic or your style. So they have like this uh, two and a half inch elastic waistband, uh, pockets or not on the back. Like I said, these pork chop pockets in the front do not come with the pattern. This is just a modification that I made and I also made some cargo pockets. They're like very not, very wrinkly and not ironed properly, but I made some cargo pockets to go on the side of them to kind of make them more like an army fatigue style pant. And I was going to elasticate the cuff also to kind of like cinch those in 
but I don't know, it just wasn't turning out like I had hoped. But it was not the fault of the pattern or anything like that. It was just that I kind of discovered along the way that these weren't really my style as I was making them. So I kind of abandoned them, but I really should finish them, if nothing else, just to finish the hem so that I can wear them around the house at least. And the fabric is really comfortable. I highly recommend tensile twill for bottom weight anything. So it would make great shorts, great pants, great skirts. Tensile twill is a really good fabric option for that. It's got a lot of drape, but a little bit of, um, it's very like opaque. And I wouldn't say like heavy necessarily, but not so lightweight that you're gonna like, I don't know, it's just like, it has a good hand for bottom weight anything. Tensile twill, T-E-N-C-E-L. Blackbird Fabric sells it, uh, fabric.com sells it. But yeah, these are the Pomona Pants by Anna Allen Clothing. Two more projects to share with you. This is another dress hack that I started a while ago. You may recognize this bodice again. This is another Simplicity 8635 bodice. So it has the front bodice and then the back, as I mentioned on most of them, ignore all this, it's not finished yet, obviously it's a whip, are these kind of lace up backs. So this one has the loops at the top and the idea is that, let me stand up and show you. It's really dark so it's hard to see, but the straps go over your shoulder, through the loop, and then kind of tie in like a triangle format and then hang down and then the center back is left open. Let me, I'll just show you the pattern photo. Okay, it's this one. Sorry, it's not very big. Trouble focusing on this camera sometimes. But yeah, it's like tie, it goes over the strap, ties through the loop, or goes through the loop and then ties and is like, the ties hang down and it leaves an open center. So that's the bodice. And then the skirt is actually the Fume Terre skirt by Deer and Doe Patterns. It's a multi-paneled skirt pattern. It has one, two, three, four, five, six, six panels on it. And normally the Fume Terre skirt buttons up in the front. But I just reversed it essentially and moved it so that it would be button up in the back where it's also open on the back of the dress. But instead of doing a button up back, I'm going to do a zipper up the center back. The fabric is so dark, so I'm sure you're not gonna be able to see this. And I'm not even really sure what this fabric is. This was a D stash from Grace. Uh, Weezer Dreams on Instagram. I learned so much from her stories. She and I were neighbors for a while. She sews in her stories and I just, a wealth of knowledge, she's a technical designer. So uh, this was something that she de-stashed and as you can see, the bodice back does not go all the way because it's an open back. So it will tie and have an open back. So the, the zip will go down the center back. I haven't finished this yet. I actually started this a while ago, well before my previous episode that I posted, because I'm just not sure, I'm not sure about it. I'm just not excited about it, maybe. It's a very wardrobe staple kind of item, a very like summery dress, but in a fall color. Not that the color is like really a, uh, Deter like I love dark colors, I wear whatever colors I want all year round, but it's just, I don't know, something about it just doesn't feel magical to me yet. So I've had it sitting unfinished because I'm just not that excited about it. It's a maxi length. I do like the color, I don't know, maybe, I'll probably finish it in time for fall and wear it like on top of like turtlenecks I think would be kind of a cool look with it or I don't know, we'll see. But that is a work in press, work in press, work in progress dress. And then the last project that I want to share with you. So as you know, I frequently dupe items that I see in ready to wear. 
One of my all-time favorite brands to do this with is a French clothing company named Cezanne. I love the aesthetic of Cezanne clothing, but it's quite expensive and out of my budget. And of course I like to sew anyway, so why not do things just for fun? So Suzanne has a dress called the Jade Dress. I'm not sure what season it was, if it's like if it's something they even sell this year. I know they had it like to like last summer, I want to say. Um, but I don't know if it's something you could purchase now or not. But it's called the Jade Dress, and it's made in this gorgeous kind of like cinnamon brown, kind of safari brown color. Loved the entire thing. And I want to dupe this dress. So I bought some fabric from Blackbird Fabrics in a very similar color. It's looking more orange on my camera, but it is definitely brown, but it is like a cinnamon brown. It's a warm brown. It's gorgeous. This is a viscose linen noil. So it's a linen blend that has viscose in it, which gives it a super fluid drape but the texture, the noil, it's kind of got this like slubby texture almost, so it has like a more casual feel. I've used this, fa used this fabric, one more time. I've used this fabric before to make my Kielo dress and it just turned out so well. So it's just such a great fabric, another great bottom weight. That really, this is a good anything fabric. It's drapey enough that it would be great for tops, um, opaque enough that it's not going to be see-through for any bottom things. It's going to have nice drape for a flowy dress with just like a little bit of structure to it. It's really, really versatile. I love it. Again, it's a uh, viscose linen noil and you can get this from Blackbird Fabrics like I did and I know that fabric.com also sells it. So I took a look through my pattern stash to try to find um, patterns I already had to dupe this Cezanne dress and I found this one. This is McCall's M7084. And I'm going to be using this view right here to dupe the dress. So here's the line drawing. I think it's easier to see kind of what's happening here. So we've got like a princess seam bodice that flows all the way through the uh, lines of the skirt part of the dress, just like the jade dress does. The only difference is that this one uh, has more coverage on the top and it's a collared dress. Of course, I don't want a collared dress. I want something that looks like that. So really all I'm planning to do is just like hack off the top, make uh, some straps and call it a day. So kind of what I did really to this dress, but with a different neckline. Uh, the bodice of M the McCall's pattern is not lined. It is, um, I believe, faced, or not faced, um, has bias bindings, like around the armhole, bindings around the armhole and such. But what I'm going to do, I laid out the pattern yesterday, and I only have two yards of it, but because it's such a close fitting dress, it doesn't really take that much fabric. So I'm going to uh, line the dress instead. Not the entire thing, just the bodice. Uh, and that, and just construct it in the same way that I did for this, uh, the strawberry dress. So I'm really excited about it. I think it's gonna be great. Uh, one kind of caveat that's been a little bit of a challenge, <sighs> big four patterns. I really, really love them. They like produce so much and there are like so many options and variations and yeah, I really, really like big four patterns. Big four are like McCall, Simplicity, Butterick, uh, Vogue. Those are big four patterns. But they typically build in a lot of positive ease into their finished garments. So when possible, I always try to look for the finished garment measurements on the pattern instead of taking what they think I should, what size I should cut based on my measurements. So for example, I always cut uh, whatever the 41 inch hip is because my hip is 41 inches and it's suggesting I cut the size 18. But the measurement at the hip line for the finished 18 is 46 inches. That's five inches of positive ease in a close fitting dress. There should be no more than like 
one to two inches tops in a close fitting dress uh, for the hips of positive ease in a dress. So like five inches of positive ease for the 18, which is the size they would have me cut. So I never look at uh, what the size suggestion is on big four patterns. I always look at the finished measurements and make my decisions based on that. I mean, if you want five inches of positive ease in the hips for this pattern, then that's great. Like you can totally do that. Select a size that uh, fits your needs. But um, I would always just try to pay attention when possible to the finished measurements on big four patterns because they typically have a lot of like positive ease built in for some reason and I don't know why and it's confusing I think to people who are just getting started with sewing because they are not expecting this and they're expecting the dress to look like how it looks on the fit model and then it turns out like not what they were expecting so just a heads up for you in case you're making big four patterns and don't know why they're not turning out properly check the finished garment measurements when possible. They don't always print them on the packet, which is annoying. Sometimes they will only print it on the pattern tissue pieces itself. So you just kind of have to look either there or on the packet. But I'm really excited to make this. But as I was mentioning, my snag is that I had to buy this pattern in the larger set of sizes. You can see right here if my camera will focus that I had to purchase the 14 through 22 in order to fit my hips, but my bust fits into the smaller range of sizes um, that's in the whatever smaller set is below this. So this is why I much prefer PDF patterns to tissue patterns, because if I was making a PDF pattern, I could just take a ruler and slowly grade up to the size I need for the bust. But as it happens, the smallest bust that they have available, the finished garment size is 39 and a half inches and my bust is 36. It doesn't mean that I can't make this pattern, it just means it's gonna be a little bit trickier to fit it because I can't blend up to like the size and the bust that I really need. I can only blend up to the smallest size available in this pattern set. And this dress in particular, Eat, like the bodice is eight pieces and the skirt is eight pieces so whenever I take in the top I'm gonna have to divide that equally amongst all of the seams and do that equally I mean I could try taking it in at the side seam we'll see how that works but in the past when I've taken things in at the side seam it wants to pull it off of my shoulders. So that's like the trade off there. So whenever I take it in, I'm gonna have to try to evenly disperse it amongst the eight pattern pieces, which is not gonna be the most fun, but will be necessary to get this dress. So that's why I much prefer PDF patterns to tissue patterns because they don't give you all of the sizes that are available. And then on top of that, um, it's more expensive, you know, like I only own five sizes where if I had the PDF pattern, usually they give you all of the sizes in a pattern. So just a little mini rant for you, but I am really excited about this dress. I hope it comes together in the way that I envision. I did search on Instagram uh, for the hashtag to see what other people have made. Nobody has hacked it in the way that I want to hack it yet, but I think um, the makes that are out there are really cute, so we'll see how it goes. It's always a gamble the first time that you're making a pattern. It's advisable to make muslins before you just go for it with your fabric like I am, but it's just not part of my process. I am a perfectionist in like almost every other area of life. If I do it with my crafting and like my me time too, it would just like nothing would ever get made or I would just kind of agonize over every single decision. And while that may be fun for some people, it's exhausting to me. So that's why I'm just not a sewing perfectionist. If you can't see it from a moving horse, then it's fine. That's like my philosophy. And the clothes I make, I think turn out great. So people I think think I'm so fearless with my making. I get that comment like quite a bit. But really, I wouldn't say it's like laziness, but I'm just like, what's the worst that could happen? It doesn't fit. And like, 
yeah, with a string of like five projects in a row, if they didn't all fit, then that would be kind of a bummer, but none of them are gonna be like that terrible. I think that sometimes we shoot ourselves in the foot by assuming that something is difficult because we hear that it's supposed to be, when really it's like, if you don't know any different, if you didn't know that something was difficult, would you still think it was? So I guess like that's kind of like the thing I'm really passionate about teaching people is to just like give it a try. I think we are so much more capable than we believe ourselves to be a lot of the time. So that's my parting Brooklyn Knit Folk wisdom for you today. That's also the end of my project. So I think I will leave you there and I will see you in two weeks in the next episode. Thank you so much for all of your support. Like I said, you can follow me over on Instagram at Jacqueline Salem. And if you would, please like this video down below because it helps other people find the video and you can subscribe to uh, get more videos from this channel. I will see you in the next episode. Bye.